Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and thank you for joining today's Chief FOIA Officers Council Annual Meeting. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Please note all audio lines have been muted until the Q&A portion of the meeting. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the meeting, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your message in the message box provided and sent. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the meeting over to Alina Sima, Director, Office of Government and Information Services. Alina, please go ahead. All right, thanks, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our very first uh, ever virtual Chief Boy Officers Council meeting and possibly not our last. Um, I hope everyone has been staying healthy, safe, and well. I am Alina Simo, Director of the Office of Government Information Services and Co-Chair of the Council. Let me introduce my Co-Chair, Bobby Talibian, Director of the Office of Information Policy at the Department of Justice. Thank you, Alina. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. We will be hearing again from Bobby shortly with some opening remarks on behalf of the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General, who unfortunately could not join us today. We have a full agenda today. In a minute, you will hear welcoming remarks from Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Bobby will provide a brief introduction on behalf of the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General, Claire Murray, uh, and he will provide a few updates, uh, followed by um, a presentation from me about some updates on the FOIA Advisory Committee. And we will be soliciting volunteers among our federal audience for the formation of the new committee, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, we will also be inviting questions and discussion uh, at, uh, at the midpoint of our, of our presentation today. And you will definitely want to stay tuned in for a lively presentation from the co-chairs of the Technology Committee, Eric Stein and Michael Sarich. We have reserved time at the end of today's session to receive public comments. We will be opening the telephone lines at the end of our meeting for any oral questions and comments from our uh, non-government uh, friends and colleagues. We are monitoring the chat on WebEx and we will read out loud any substantive questions or comments. And we are also simultaneously live streaming today's meeting on the NARA YouTube channel and we will also read out loud any substantive questions or comments. So with that, I would like to introduce Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, for some welcoming remarks. David, over to you. Thanks, Elena. Good morning and welcome to, um, from 700 Pennsylvania Avenue, where we would ordinarily be meeting, and I look forward to the time when we do actually welcome you to this building again. I'm proud of the role that the National Archives plays in this important government-wide council of senior official tasks with ensuring FOIA compliance. As many of you in attendance know, the Federal FOIA Ombudsman's Office is housed right here in the National Archives, where every day OGIS staff works to make access happen and connect with customers. The timing and agenda for today's meeting form a nice confluence. 55 years ago this week, the U.S. Senate passed a bill to amend the Administrative Procedure Act by clarifying and protecting the right of the public to information. As Senator Mike Mansfield of Montana noted on the Senate floor on October 13, 1965, the balance between disclosing and withholding government information is not easy. Success, he said, lies in providing a workable formula which encompasses, balances, and protects all interests, yet places emphasis on the fullest responsible disclosure. The bill would go on to pass the House in June 1966, and the next month FOIA was signed into law. Fifty-five years after the Senate passed the original FOIA, the challenge of balancing openness and secrecy continues. Added to the mix are the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19 and the telework environment in which many of you and your agency's FOIA processing staff members have been operating. No doubt many of you have not been to your government offices since early March. Later this morning, we will hear an interagency discussion about success and challenges 
to FOIA processing during the COVID pandemic, challenges that certainly weren't foreseen when the Council last met in 2019. I look forward to a discussion by the Chief FOIA Officers Council regarding one of the 22 recommendations that the FOIA Advisory Committee sent to me earlier this year. The Advisory Committee now in its fourth term is composed of government professionals and members of the requester community whom I appoint to study the federal FOIA landscape and advise me on improvements to FOIA administration. Recommendation 16, which I support, is for the Chief FOIA Officers Council to create a committee of cross-agency collaboration and innovation. I look forward to the committee's creation today and collaborative and innovative work in the coming months. Collaboration and innovation are key to giving senior leaders and their staffs the tools they need to meet Senator Mansfield's definition of success, balancing all interests while emphasizing responsible disclosure. Please take care and stay safe, and I now turn the meeting back to Bobby Talibian. Thank you, Ms. Ferrio. Very much appreciate that. And um, thank you all again for joining, and uh, congratulations to all the agencies on closing out fiscal year 20. I wanted to pass uh, along uh, the regards of the Principal Deputy Attorney General, Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General of the United States, uh, Ms. Claire Murray, who very much wanted to be here to kick off our first meeting in the new fiscal year. Uh, the Department of Justice, as you know, takes very seriously our role in encouraging government-wide compliance with the FOIA. And, the chief, and as the Chief FOIA Officer of the Department, the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General appreciates the challenges Chief FOIA Officers face in managing high volumes of requests that have become increasingly complex while also managing new workplace precautions and realities. The Department's FOIA guidelines stress and experience has proven the important leadership role Chief FOIA Officers play in the success of FOIA administration. That is why the work of this council is so important to help us ensure that agencies are making use of all available resources to improve FOIA administration and that we together find new ways to enhance our ability to provide this vital service to our democracy. Ms. Murray would like to thank all agencies for joining us for today and for your continued efforts in advancing government-wide FOIA administration. And I just want to thank uh, Ms. Murray for her message and her continued support. With that, uh, I had some updates that I wanted to provide from OIP um, on some of the work that we're doing and the re resources available to agencies. So we can start with the next slide. I thought I'd just highlight um, some reporting updates, um, initiatives of FOIA.gov, uh, and make sure to highlight the resources available to your agencies um, uh, from OIP uh, to help in your FOIA administration. Next slide. So starting off with FOIA reporting, next slide. Just this, uh, just, uh, just this past summer, we issued, as we concluded the 2020 uh, reporting uh, season by issuing our summary and assessment of the 2020 Chief FOIA Officer Reports. Uh, the summary assessment reflects a number of uh, key milestones that agencies should and have been focusing on. Uh, in their uh, FOIA administration. And I encourage agencies to review uh, the summary uh, and references to many of the agencies' work in that summary, as well as uh, the agency's individual reports. Next slide. Uh, accompanying the summary, we issued guidance based off our, our review of the reports on areas for agencies to continue to focus on for uh, improvement. Uh, we emphasized uh, timeliness, reducing backlogs, um, and expedited pro responding to expedited process requests, especially in light of challenges that, uh, unique challenges that agencies have faced in 2020 and now are facing uh, in 2020 and 2021, going into 2021. Um, uh, in particular, during this reporting, pro uh, the 2020 CFO reporting uh, process, agencies had faced a long uh, government shutdown, uh, which impacted processing time. So we did account for that, and, and agencies explained some of the, a lot of success stories and how uh, they were able to overcome some of those challenges. Uh, in 2021, and now obviously uh, um, with uh, the, the recent pandemic, a lot of um, and the new workplace precautions, agencies have had to adjust uh, and reemphasizing the guidance that we issued in May 
Uh, regarding uh, agencies and administrations in light of COVID-19, many uh, different ways agencies can mitigate um, some of the challenges that they face uh, working in a telework environment. Um, and so encourage you to uh, continuously to take a, take a look at that guidance and reach out to us if you have any questions or if we can give any assistance in the unique challenges that your agency might face um, as, you're, as we all work through uh, the new realities of the workplace. Next slide. So as uh, that reporting season has concluded, we have now issued the Chief War Officer Report guidelines for the 2020 CFO report. We wanted to highlight a number of key dates. Uh, as in prior years, or as in last, just similar to last year, we have uh, divided the reporting requirements between large volume agencies, namely those agencies that receive more than 50 requests, or medium to large uh, volume agencies and agencies that was received uh, 50 requests or less. Um, those agencies uh, that receive more than 50 requests are required to provide their report to OIP by January 11th. Um, and those agencies receiving less than 50 are not required to report, but are encouraged to report if um, there are efforts that they have undertaken that they would uh, like to discuss or challenges that are not reflected in their annual FOIA report. All agencies, and then our, we will work with your agency to review um, review and finalize the report, and all agency CFR reports are to be posted by March 15, 2021, uh, Sunshine Week. Next slide. So we've continued as, uh, from the beginning of the CFR report to continue to focus on five key areas of FOIA administration. The new guidelines do the same, and so we're focusing on uh, FOIA administration and applying the presumption of openness in FOIA administration, ensuring that your agency has effective systems in place to respond to FOIA requests, improving and increasing proactive disclosures, increasing the utilization of technology, and improving timeliness and reducing uh, backlog. Next slide. While the main areas of focus uh, remain the same, we have, as you have throughout the years, adjusted the questions to reflect uh, uh, maturation of agency's FOIA programs, our interactions with the public, uh, as well as with agencies, and obviously new challenges in the reality that have occurred since the last reporting, or new issues that have occurred since the last reporting period. So for the 2020 FOIA guidelines, just to highlight some of the new questions that we're um, asking agencies to include in their report, um, more, a little bit more focus on FOIA training and the chief FOIA officer's role in providing that uh, training to uh, their agency FOIA um, professionals and, and agency personnel. Uh, questions focusing on standard, having standard operating procedures and reviewing those standard operating procedures. A survey question on agencies that have a large volume of first party requests and whether some of those requests can be handled or have we explored handling them through alternative means or access. Updates uh, on agencies uh, review and updates of their FOIA regulation. And of course, this year we're very much interested in continuing to hear from you uh, the impacts of COVID, how you've adjusted challenges and success stories that we can uh, leverage uh, across agencies. Next slide. So the counterpart to the, the Chief FOIA Officer Report is obviously the annual FOIA report that has all the detailed statistics uh, of your agency's FOIA administration during the fiscal year. Uh, the deadline for agency annual FOIA reports to the Department of Justice is November 16th. Um, and then as we receive your reports, we will work with you um, to do that validation and uh, finalize them. We, all agency reports are required to be completed on your, uh, posted on your website and on FOIA.gov by March 1, 2021. We have updated the Department of Justice annual FOIA report handbook uh, that was posted just earlier last week. Um, with uh, addressing some of the uh, addressing some elements of new questions as well as uh, streamlining it so it, it, it's more accessible and um, covering the new Department of Justice tool on FOIA.gov that agencies are going to be using this year uh, to submit their annual FOIA report, um, which will hopefully provide, which is designed to provide a more efficient way of uh, producing the report as well as um, additional data validation. In fact, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, we are having a training on the annual FOIA report. Um, so if your agency uh, uh, point of contact for the annual FOIA report has not 
register or need to have that training, please let us know. It is at capacity, but we will add on um, any agency uh, POCs that we uh, that that need this uh, training in order to complete your agency's annual FOIA report. Um, and of course, if needed, we can schedule a, another session as well. Next slide. Some just re updates on FOIA.gov. Um, as, as many of you know, FOIA.gov launched in 2010 as a central website for agency FOIA administration for the public to know how the FOIA works and access uh, all the annual FOIA report data. Um, and next slide. And uh, in 2018, we launched um, a, a, the National FOIA Portal, which allows uh, requesters to make requests to any of the agencies um, from FOIA.gov. Um, but in addition to that, provides a wealth of knowledge, particular to each agency and on how the FOIA works, um, including agency your agency's FOIA regulations, a standardized template um, for response, providing requests, uh, links to your FOIA library, uh, and so on. Since that launch, we've, uh, we were excited to continue to get user feedback, both from the public and agencies, and have been enhancing the site based off that feedback. Uh, there are some examples of those uh, enhancements here. I won't, I won't go through all of them, um, but uh, would like to highlight some of the new things that we've been doing. Next slide. So upcoming enhancement we're excited about is a revamp of the annual FOIA report data pages uh, of the FOIA.gov. Um, we are combining uh, the basic and advanced reporting functions in just in a very much more streamlined way where you can more easily access and compare and search the annual FOIA report data that each of your agencies report each year by against your agency or against other agencies. The results can be viewed in FOIA.gov or downloaded in an open format on the C C CSV. Uh, it'll also be much more, mo it'll be mobile friendly. Next slide. So here's just a preview. Um, you can see the old old format on the left and the new format on, on the right. And so hopefully we'll have this deployed soon for both agencies and the public to be able to use. Next slide. We're also excited to uh, implement and start using uh, new tools uh, that are going to permit us to gather uh, more information, more detailed information about agencies and the public's use of FOIA.gov. Uh, as you know, the site's dynamic in that the public use side has a lot of information about the FOIA, how to make a request, and then uh, the, the ability to submit the request. But on the agency side, um, agencies are able to update their information um, directly uh, and now provide their annual FOIA report data through there as well. So we're interested to see how the public agencies are using the system and using that information to be able to further improve the site. Next slide. So one thing we're really excited about is uh, the big project that we're going to be working on this year is improving the searchability on FOIA.gov of the FOIA libraries. Um, and the idea being here, we want, their, we want the public to be able to find, access, and locate records that they're interested in easily without a FOIA request, um, wherever they are on the FOIA website, but particularly in FOIA libraries, um, so that it's very simple just to search across all agency FOIA libraries for any type of records that may already be publicly available. Um, this is a, is a very popular, both on the public and agency side initiative, um, and we're excited that we recently uh, we're awarded phase one funding from GS's 10X project uh, to start working on this idea um, in the first two quarters of this fiscal year. Uh, as we're working on this, we welcome suggestions from all the chief board officers here today and the public on um, ways that make best ways to do this, best user experience, as well as um, any other uh, uh, enhancements uh, we'd like to see the FOIA.gov. Next slide. We are continuing to work with you, um, your agencies on interoperability. So I want to thank agencies for their interoperability plans. Um, as you know, agencies with automated case management systems are required to implement the API by fiscal year 21. Agencies with non-automated solutions have already achieved their interoperability. Um, but if your agency is, is, is not working with us directly, you know, please do contact us and connect with us on implementing the API, uh, and we'll continue to reach out as well. Next slide. 
So then lastly, I just wanted to highlight, uh, uh, given that it's our, our, our first meeting of the year, uh, resources available to your agencies, making sure that your agencies are taking advantage of them. Um, next slide. First, of course, is the Department of Justice Guide to the FOIA. Uh, it's a comprehensive legal treatise on all aspects of the FOIA, uh, detailed discussions of, uh, of the case law on FOIA's procedural requirements, exemptions, and litigation considerations. Um, next slide. We did complete a full update of the slide, of the, of the, uh, the guide, every chapter of it in 2019, and we've continued that momentum in updating and rolling fashion the chapters uh, to make sure that they're continuously being updated um, and having a full update happen every two years. Uh, recently, we've already published new chapters for proactive disclosure, exemption two, fees and fee waivers, and we'll continue to be doing that. So please keep an eye out for that. But in addition to the Department of Justice Guide to the FOIA, next slide. You, uh, to have the most up-to-date um, uh, on, to be, to be most up-to-date on the case law, uh, encourage agencies to use the guide as well as their FOIA court decision summaries, which are regularly being updated on the newest FOIA decisions in the state of case law. Next slide. FOIA self-assessment toolkit. Um, I think we, we, we have stressed um, that uh, in order for us to be able to improve our FOIA administration uh, continuously, it's important that we continuously assess each aspect of the FOIA administration. Uh, and this can be integral in creating short and long-term improvement plans. Uh, we issued a FOIA assessment toolkit a number of years ago that breaks down each um, part of the FOIA process from intake to search to responding to requesters and provides a format that agency can make an objective assessment of uh, where they are and, and, and how they can improve and uh, compiling guidance and resources related to those areas. Uh, we're excited to hopefully soon have uh, new modules uh, in a revamped FOIA self-assessment toolkit uh, that includes and embeds in it uh, the use of technology and has new modules on appeals, the administrative appeal process, and proactive disclosures. So keep, that'll be something to keep an eye out this year. Next slide. And these are just some of the, the many areas the toolkit already covers. Next slide. So in addition, we are continuing to do best practices workshop, uh, the best practices workshop series. Um, focusing on various topics in FOIA administration, uh, such as backlog reduction, technology, customer service, FOIA training, proactive disclosures, where we would like to hear from some of the agencies that have had particular success in this area so that other agencies can benefit from uh, the, the, their strategies and the way they've been able to um, uh, achieve their accomplishments. Uh, we are hoping to have a, a proactive best practices workshop um, on another perspective on technology soon, particularly with the use of e-discovery tools. But wanted to uh, take a moment here to ask agencies, uh, agency chief FOIA officers, to let us know what best practices workshops um, they would find beneficial um, for us to, to and, and if their agency would like to participate in such workshops. And then finally, of course, um, OIP continues its training program. Uh, we've switched over to virtual training uh, in, in providing more regular training on discrete topics. Um, FOIA training, I think, is essential to agencies, for FOIA professional agencies' success in FOIA administration. Um, and so uh, if you're, we encourage, your, encourage you to uh, let your, uh, encourage you to encourage your agency FOIA professionals to attend training, our training, or Oh, and if, uh, if there are topics that uh, we have not covered in our, our regular schedule training, please let us know. Um, and also we continue to and look forward to providing tailored training to program to, agency, uh, to agencies um, that would find that beneficial as well. So and with that, just want to thank again everyone for, uh, for joining and um, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions from agencies on the, on the WebEx um, or online. Uh, about any of these initiatives or uh, resources. 
Sure, we have a couple of questions on the WebEx. Um, this is Lindsay. Before I get to those, one reminder to all of our attendees, uh, we do ask that members of the public uh, please hold your question until our public comment uh, session towards the end of the presentation. Um, I did receive one public comment, which I have noted, uh, and we'll read out at the end. Uh, so if you have a, if you're a member of the public, uh, we do ask, kindly ask that you hold your input until the end. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from agencies. The first one is, are FOIA libraries the same as FOIA reading rooms? Yes. Um, so uh, that was a, a name change that we made a while ago. Um, as, as you know, uh, the, the, the idea of the FOIA reading room goes back way back in the statute. And um, years ago, or decades ago, um, if you wanted to, to view the records in an agency that the agency is required to provide proactively, you would physically go to a reading room in, in, their, uh, in their building to view those. Uh, in light of the reality and the fact that now all of these are, are online, um, we call them FOIA libraries. So you can see the term used interchangeably, um, but they are the same thing. Great. And we had one other question which um, is asking about the Chief FOIA Officer Report Guidelines uh, from Mr. Laver. Um, I would like to clarify that the link that you provided actually is linking to our 2020 guidelines, which would have been last year's guidelines. So we're now onto the 2021 guidelines, uh, which are based on FY19 data. Uh, so just wanted to clarify that. Um, Thank you, Lindsay. And no other questions from the WebEx at this time. All right, well, thank you. Well, I guess with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Alina. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Bobby. We really appreciate that. A lot of information. That's great. And uh, we're planning to post uh, the PowerPoint slide deck that you presented on our website. I believe you guys are going to do the same thing on the OIP website. So anyone who missed all of that great content, you will see it soon. So um, if I could ask our event producer to turn over to the next slide deck. There we go. Okay, so we're back to the theme. And uh, next slide, please. So one of several ways that um, our office tries to improve the administration of FOIA is through our work on the FOIA Advisory Committee, which I chair. Uh, the OIT director, Bobby, most recently, um, has been a continuous member of that committee. The committee brings together members of the FOIA community from inside and outside of government to collaboratively identify the greatest challenges in the administration of FOIA and develop recommendations for the Archivist of the United States. As of today, the committee has made a total of 30 recommendations, if you can believe that, that's incredible, uh, to the Archivist and has advanced over 35 best practices. They cover a broad range of topics all designed to improve the FOIA process and access to government documents. Some of these recommendations are already complete, some are in progress, and some are just starting to roll our sleeves up to get started on. We will soon be adding a dashboard feature on our OGIS website that will track the status of each of the committee's recommendations. So please look to that. Next slide, please. Earlier this year, on June 4th, uh, 2020, the 2018-2020 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee held its final meeting and concluded its work on the final report and recommendations. I am incredibly grateful to the 2018-2020 committee members who continue to work through to the finish line despite the challenges of the global pandemic, telework, and remote meetings. The committee's final report and recommendations dated July 9, 2020, was transmitted to the Archivist of the United States and contains an unprecedented 22 separate recommendations. The final report is available on the OGIS website. The link is uh, there on the slide. And since I only have a short time with you today, I will share an overview of the report and where we go from here. Next slide, please. Some of you may recall my presentation a couple of years ago in which I used colorful buckets to illustrate recommendations and best practices advanced by the 2016-2018 FOIA Advisory Committee. I decided to continue with that bucket theme today, but I'm relying on some pictures from the uh, National Archives catalog. So um, I 
gives proper source information at the bottom in case everyone, anyone wants to check in with us. Uh, next slide, please. So the first bucket is the largest one. Uh, that has recommendations that uh, total 15 uh, to the National Archives, to OGIS, to OIP, and to federal agencies. The categories are broken down into the five areas you see listed there. I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, several recommendations will require collaboration between OGIS and OIP, and we have already started our discussions and best ways to move forward. Some of the recommendations look to OIP to issue further guidance to agencies on such topics as improving online descriptions of the FOIA process, inclusion of records management related materials and FOIA handbooks on the agency website, and the use of e discovery tools to assist agencies in searches of electronic records. Uh, other recommendations rely on OGIS to conduct assessments and work with its NARA colleagues to advance the idea of public access to federal records as part of NARA's Federal Electronic Records Modernization Initiative, FERMI, and liaison with NARA colleagues and OIP to develop records management training for FOIA professionals, as well as briefings for incoming senior leaders following changes in administration or leadership. Federal agencies also have some to-dos on their list. Collect, describe, and give access to records in one or more central repository and on agency websites. Release FOIA documents on websites in open, legible, machine-readable, machine-actionable formats. Make commonly requested documents available outside the FOIA process. For more details, please uh, look at the report. Next slide, please. Bucket three. Uh, you'll notice I skipped bucket two. I will come back to that at the end. Bucket three has the smallest amount of recommendations, only one, but it's a good one, for the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, or SIGI. We will be asking the SIGI chair to initiate a cross-cutting project that will examine how successful agency FOIA programs are in providing access to agency records in electronic and digital form. So please stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. Bucket four has two recommendations for Congress, to engage in regular and robust oversight of FOIA, and I know a lot of agency professionals will be pleased to hear. The second one is to address funding for agency FOIA programs, always a very important topic for all of us uh, FOIA professionals. Next slide, please. Bucket five, looking to the future. Uh, that uh, set of recommendations uh, actually asks the archivist to guide ongoing and future federal data strategies to include FOIA and promote research into the use of AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to improve FOIA searches and processing of requests. And the archivist is excited to pursue both of those, and so uh, we will be working with him to, to continue that work. Uh, and this is a good opportunity for me to address where the current term of the committee is headed. You've heard the archivist mention that the 2020-2022 term kicked off uh, already. We had our first virtual meeting on September 10th, 2020. Uh, we have some returning and some new members. Uh, following a robust discussion, the fourth term of the committee has decided to form four subcommittees, classification, legislation, process, and technology. We will be asking each of the subcommittees to help out with certain of the 2018-2020 recommendations. For example, the legislation subcommittee can help with more specific details we can provide to Congress regarding those two recommendations. The subcommittees are currently working on their mission statement or objective, which we will post as soon as they are complete. The committee's next meeting will take place virtually on Thursday, December 10th, 2020. So we hope you will be able to join us on this same WebEx channel and uh, different telephone lines. Next slide, please. You may have figured out by now that I saved the best for last, bucket number two, uh, that contains two recommendations specifically directed to our meeting today, the CFO Council. One recommendation asks the Council to work with agency leadership to issue an annual memorandum on the importance of FOIA. A continuation of the FOIA is everyone's responsibility theme that we have all known for years. Uh, so agency leadership, if you're hearing this, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be in touch. You'll be hearing from me and Bobby. 
The second recommendation asks the council to create a new committee. That new committee will research and propose cross-agency grant programs and other FOIA funding sources, create career paths for FOIA professionals, and promote models to align agency resources with agency transparency. Next slide, please. So uh, let's form the council's second committee. The first one is the technology committee. We'll be hearing from those co-chairs shortly. Um, I would like to suggest the name of the committee for cross-agency collaboration and innovation would be a great starting point. Uh, Bobby and I are actively seeking volunteer government FOIA professionals to help us stand up and share this committee. So uh, our email addresses are up on the website right now, on, on the slide right now. So please email us both if you are interested in volunteering and uh, the more the merrier. So we welcome any and all folks who are interested in, in this effort. Um, the good news is that the FOIA Advisory Committee has given the committee a roadmap for how to proceed that will help guide the members as they move forward so you're not starting completely from scratch. Um, also, if anyone is um, monitoring, we are monitoring the chat, sorry, and if anyone is interested in volunteering, even as of right now on the chat, please don't be shy. Um, throw your name out and we'll be happy to follow up. Next slide, please. So Bobby, Bobby and I have both covered a lot of information up until now. Um, we wanted to take this opportunity to see if there are any questions from, from our agency colleagues. Um, this is a bit more challenging to do in this virtual environment as opposed to when we're in the McGowan Theater and asking folks to come up to the mic. Uh, but we'll definitely try our best. Uh, if any questions have come in via chat, we will cover those. Or if you have any questions right now, chat them to us right now. Uh, we will also ask our event producer to open up telephone lines to our federal colleagues who want to raise any issues. And we particularly want to hear from agency folks who have been facing challenges uh, and the challenges they've been encountering uh, in their FOIA programs during this very difficult pandemic period. So um, we'd be happy to, to hear from folks on that. Um, I'm going to ask Lindsay if she sees anything on the chat from our agency friends. Yes, so we have one more logistical question on the chat from Mr. Osumi about the annual report training tomorrow. Um, you're correct that the Eventbrite registration has ended, but please, you can email OIP directly and ask to be added to that registration. Uh, please email us at doj.oip.foia at usdoj.gov and we'll get you signed up. But no other questions in the chat at this time. Okay, don't be shy, please continue to chat. Uh, and I'm gonna to turn to my colleague, Martha Murphy. Martha, do we have any chat questions on from the YouTube side? Nope, nothing yet. Okay. Well, well, while people are, uh, yeah, actually, while people are maybe are taking some time to, make, uh, to think of if, if something they may want to talk about, I, I do, we, uh, both we and I did want to, to mention that we do plan to have these meetings more regularly. Uh, and so we really would welcome not just, uh, you know, either now or uh, anytime, shoot us an email, some of the topics that, you, your, you, that agencies would like us to address or cover in these meetings. Um, I think that, as I said, as uh, echoing the message from the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General, the, the leadership of the CFOs and the work of this council is very important. and. Uh, um, our success depends on each other. Yes, thanks, Bobby. And we haven't set any dates yet, but we will plan to do so soon. So please check both of our websites for additional information on that. And as Bobby mentioned earlier, we are very open to any topics for the next council meeting agendas. If uh, there are particular issues that agencies would like to discuss, we're very open to that as well. So I see, um, Lindsay, are there any other chat questions? I just want to make sure um, that we haven't missed anything before we move on. No other questions, although we did have our first volunteer for the new committee. So putting that out there as a way to encourage any other participation and volunteers, um, feel free to put your name in the chat and I'll make note of those. 
Okay, terrific. All right, so Bobby and I are, are very happy to end this meeting early, um, and we are a little bit ahead of our agenda schedule, which is just fine. Either that or our next presenters are going to take up the entire time they've been allotted, which is also perfectly fine with us as well. Um, so um, next, I'm very excited to turn the floor over to the co-chairs of the CFO Council's first forum committee, the Technology Committee. Uh, they are joining us today to tell us about the exciting work uh, that the committee has already accomplished and the work they are taking on in this upcoming year. The Technology Committee was formed in September 2018 as a result of the past FOIA Advisory Committee recommendation. And although they were originally stood up as a subcommittee, uh, we have elevated their status to a full committee. Uh, so, and up until today, they were the only one. Now they will always, always be the first one as well. So I'm very pleased to welcome the co-chairs of the Technology Committee, Eric Stein and Michael Sarich. A brief introduction of both. Um, Eric is the Director of the Office of Information Programs and Services at the State Department. His office is responsible for the Department's Records Management, FOIA, Privacy Act, classification, declassification, library and other records and information access programs. Mike is the Veterans Health Administration's FOIA Director and leads the program with over 300 FOIA and Privacy Act officers who handle over 25,000 requests across 151 facilities worldwide. So lots of great experience from both. So I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Michael and Eric. Great, well, good morning. Uh, this is Eric Stein. First, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to all the chief FOIA officers, to all of our members of the public joining us. Uh, my name is Eric Stein, and I'm joined with Mike Sarich. Mike, say hello. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. A real pleasure to be here. And we are the co-chairs of the Chief FOIA Officer Council Technology Committee. Next slide, please. Uh, we've... Mike and I have worked uh, throughout the year with our committee uh, to make really good progress from where we were about a year ago uh, when we were just starting to figure out uh, our, our charter, our mission, and our mandate. Uh, next slide, please. So we were created uh, by the FOIA Advisory Committee in a recommendation as mentioned previously, and we've spent the past almost two years uh, developing a, a, a governance structure and really trying to understand the technology issues the FOIA community faces. And one of the biggest changes we've had over the past uh, year is that this year, it, right in the throes of the pandemic, we had an increase in our membership by about 25 people. So uh, despite the challenges of remote work for many agencies, it was the first time they were working remotely mm -hmm. ever, we were able to create a new group and body with uh, about 40 members now, and we've created a governance structure with eight different groups working on focused technology issues with the intention of uh, working and to improve FOIA, whether it be FOIA case processing at agencies, sharing best practices, and increasing uh, confidence and awareness in technology in general. Um, it's just a couple things to walk through where we've been in the past year. Uh, in February, we released our report, and it's on the OGIS website, uh, uh, Best Practices and Recommendations. And Michael will be talking about those recommendations in a moment. In April, Mike, Michael and I co-chaired a Best Practices Workshop, a co-led a Best OIP Best Practices Workshop on FOIA and technology with about 500 participants. And April's significance, the pandemic was just underway at that time, uh, and we did it virtually. It was, I think, the first time we did that ever virtually. Also, in April is when we added those 25 members. And in June and July, we started uh, these working groups I mentioned. We'll go into detail on those today. And we've been spending uh, the past few months working on charters, which we'll also be talking about. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Mike to talk about uh, the best practices report and recommendations, and also, uh, we're going to go into detail about the working group. So, Mike, over to you. Well, thank you so much. And the real strength of the committee, as Eric uh, mentioned, is the diversity of uh, panels that we have. We have members from, from a really huge, um, a hugely diverse group of federal agencies, some very big, some very small, and kind of everyone in between. February 14th, we issued what we call kind of our Valentine's to the FOIA community. 
um, in this report with uh, a number of best practices, again, drawn from the strength of the different uh, members of the committee working on very large agencies, very small agencies. We really want to make sure that the recommendations are scalable and appropriate for the different size FOIA operations. But specifically talking about the recommendations that we, um, that we made, the first one, um, and the number of these are largely uh, are implemented or underway, <laughs> join up. Um, and the first one was to maintain a technology committee, and we were, and we were um, upgraded from a subcommittee to, to a full committee. We're very appreciative of that and um, have maintained the momentum there. The second and third recommendations that we made were to um, put on the GSA schedule records and then FOIA case management. And what this enables um, the smaller agencies, the agencies that don't have that um, ability to scale up and get these larger contracts, the same access that the big players have in the, in the FOIA space. So one second. Okay. Um, and then in addition, the, uh, the fourth and fifth recommendations were having um, rolling events, uh, opportunities for engagement, and we'll talk more about these um, in just a second when we move to uh, the working groups and their charters and, and the jobs that they're going to be, uh, to be doing. And finally, the FOIA committee serves as a body that can assist a group uh, to go to, um, sorry, for FOIA programs that are looking for some, some technology assistance where they have questions about how can they implement these best practices in their agency. So we're, as a standing body, a group that agencies, chief FOIA officers can come to and ask questions in a very safe, uh, safe environment as they, as they look to add technology to their, uh, to the programs and move forward um, there. And, so many, and as I mentioned, so many of these recommendations are completed or actively moving forward. Again, one of the great strengths of this committee is that it's a very action-oriented group and we're looking forward to not just having these reports, but to actually taking, that, taking the actions indicated in the report and moving uh, the field forward. Mike, if I may, I just want to add here, yes, uh, you know, we've, you've heard a lot about working groups and committees so far at this meeting, and there's a lot of committees, a lot of working groups. We're very uh, uh, sensitive to uh, the fact that we don't want to duplicate efforts. So under Bobby and Alina's leadership, we carefully coordinate with these other bodies. And I want to be very clear, uh, the FOIA Advisory Committee, for example, has, is a public-private partnership and its membership is, is, is wonderful because we get perspectives we wouldn't just necessarily get from having a government-only group. So we take those recommendations and find the best forum in which to, to, to take action. But our committee here, the technology committee we're talking about today, we, our, our primary focus is improving uh, awareness, training, development for FOIA professionals, including understanding the resources that are already out there in the government, so we're not asking for things if they, don't, if they already exist and we may be able to get them, uh, providing means of discussing how to get access to those tools. Uh, techno again, focus on technology uh, and how to share best practices through the various communities. And so, as you heard, there are other working groups looking at technology and, and, and these different areas. Uh, we, we actually are in touch with them. We're working with them. And I'm remiss because I didn't mention uh, last month we did brief the FOIA Advisory Committee and got some really good feedback and perspective uh, that uh, they were ideas that uh, that have been discussed in one way or another possibly in the past, but coming from the, the public, members of the public, uh, and others helps to really improve our thinking about how do we resolve these issues. So, Mike, back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the the keys, kind of piggybacking piggybacking on what Eric's um, uh, kind of expressing here, is that we want to make sure that the tech, the lessons that we're learning from this diverse group of people that we're able to share them as widely as possible in the FOIA community. So, as Eric mentioned, being able to do the best practice workshop. Um, being able to, uh, to to present here today and to be able to work with the FOIA Advisory Committee, who's also, um, you know, has, technology, has a technology piece. We were able to talk with them just last week on some um, uh, kind of uh, initiatives that they're working on and making sure that we're working, you know, collaboratively in this in this space, which is so critical to moving the FOIA uh, the FOIA practice forward, kind of uh, government wide. The eight working groups again, and this is a working this is a working committee. This is a committee that is all about Putting um, putting actions forward. It's all about moving the um, the FOIA field forward, and we've organized kind of around eight eight pillars. And those pillars we're working on um, working on finalizing uh, charters, and we've got some some exciting news coming coming up. So let's move to the next slide, and we'll we'll share with with you guys what the eight 
uh, working groups are, and Eric and I have kind of divided these up. So I'll talk about a couple, then Eric will talk about a couple, and you'll have a full briefing and a full kind of overview of where we're at right now, and more importantly, where we're going together. So first off is Collaborative Tools, which I'm very, which I'm very fortunate to be able to work with. And what Collaborative Tools is all about in, in many ways is as we, as agencies continue to embrace new technology. So for example, um, at the Veterans Health Administration where we've moved from, from Skype to Microsoft Teams, what are kind of the implications in, from a FOIA perspective on using these new collaborative tools? So for example, where a Skype message May or, not, may or may not have been retained, just depending on an agency, depending on um, what the sworn says. Now, in Microsoft Teams, all of that information is being captured. So for an agency perspective, from a FOIA perspective, we've kind of trained our personnel, you know, um, the people that work at the Veterans Health Administration and, and the Veterans Administration, that, hey, if you have a Skype message, maybe it's, you know, it's not going to be captured, so you can, you know, you can talk in this way. But now it's not. Now it's going to be captured. So. What is our role there as FOIA professionals to make sure that um, we are providing all of this information to the employees and our, our teammates across the uh, across the administration? Because the last thing that you'd want to know, the last thing you want to hear is, well, I thought that wasn't going to, you know, kind of uh, to go out. So you want to make sure that there's a wide um, understanding of what uh, fo what FOIA roles and responsibilities are as these new collaborative tools come into being. Everyone's seen the, the incredible pivot that we've made government-wide to remote work, you know, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. With that pivot has come a large increase in collaborative tools, and understanding that implication in the FOIA space is critical as we move forward. So very happy to work with that, with that group, and they're doing great work. Uh, the next group I'm also able to work with is 508 Compliance, um, kind of piggybacking on what Bobby was talking about to even open this, uh, this session. There's many areas of the FOIA where we're looking to make sure that we get information out to the public as much as we can, whether it be in FOIA reading rooms or whether it be on programmatic websites, whatever it may be, to get the information to the people uh, that need it. You know, and maybe that obviates a FOIA request because the information is there, or you can direct a FOIA requester to this information that's already publicly available. Well, making sure that that information is readable by the entire community is critical. You know, we all have this 508 uh, compliance mandate. And it's a good mandate because it enables every citizen and every requester to be able to access this information. You don't place people on favored tiers based on ability. So understanding this, um, understanding this responsibility and understanding how you can achieve, you know, full kind of 508 compliance as a FOIA program is important. It, it's an issue that comes up every year at ASAP. It comes up over and over again in informal conversations that you have with peers in the, um, in the FOIA community. And one of the things that the Technology Committee has certainly um, has discovered but has certainly highlighted is that agencies are at different locations. Some agencies are very large and they have robust tools. And some agencies are kind of, uh, they're not just, they're not as large and they don't have those same tools. So being able to provide, you know, kind of guideposts and guidelines for folks at agencies of all sizes is going to be critical, I think, moving forward to ensure that we're posting as much as we can online, that we're providing the people with as, with as much information as, as possible. And now, Eric, uh, we'll toss it over to you for FOIA searches. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, before I go into FOIA searches, I know we have the chief FOIA officers uh, here with us today, uh, as well as or, or their representatives. Um, in each of these areas, we found throughout the year that uh, the practitioners at your agencies have really worked hard to, ident to either identify the issues and propose solutions or find ways to move forward. In some cases, uh, they've really had to uh, make some changes and pivots to their programs. Uh, so uh, all the support that you provide to them is much appreciated. It's one of the best things, uh, it, it doesn't, it, especially in, uh, it's one of the best things I think that can be done. And I just want to say thank you because we do hear positive stories about your employees feeling supported, uh, and, and that does matter, and it does help with morale, and especially in this remote environment and balancing everything else. Everything else, anything we can do to help improve FOIA processing matters. So just a brief thank you there. Um, and, and now going into FOIA searches, which is a, a, a very hot topic, especially in the electronic um, in the electronic uh, age. So uh, searches, each of these groups. Um, I hear that my camera has gone fuzzy, so <laughs> one second. And may this resolve the issue. Um, moving on, um, FOIA searches. 
this is a challenge uh, in general. It used to be agencies couldn't find records uh, in the paper environment, uh, but then uh, we've moved to a situation where we have so much information at agencies, uh, we're getting overwhelmed and inundated by doing searches. Add on top of that the challenges of not all records are accessible remotely because of sensitivity or if they're classified, and we could talk about that in the classified section in a few minutes. Uh, this created real challenges. For example, some agencies have FOIA case processing software for the case processing piece that they could work on remotely, but they did not have means of accessing some of the search tools for records they would need to get into said systems during the pandemic. And so uh, agencies are working really hard to look at these issues um, and find out the best way to do so in a way that also ensures their safety and the safety of their families, everyone's around them, and who's coming to the office and how. Um, I know it may sound like a very simple issue, but it, it, it's a, a real challenge right now um, in terms of how to get and how to do the best searches as possible. Um, that's something out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Moving on to kind of the broader mandate of this uh, SPOIA search committee in general, we're, we're, as Michael and I have mentioned, finishing charters. And you know, well, what, why are we talking about the charter so much? Mike and I firmly believe that each of these groups need to have a clearly scoped mission with deliverables so that when we finish that work, uh, either we, we sunset the respective committee and move on to a different topic and reshift our resources there or keep moving forward. I think searches will be one that we work on for a while. And I'll just give you an example. For the FOIA search group, their charter right now, we're looking at three primary proposed areas. One being, and we've already started, outreach to agencies, all of you um, on the line and, and our counterparts who aren't with us today, looking at their best practices and challenges in just doing electronic record searches for FOIA in just period. We're not really gonna distinguish between COVID or not because we are where we are right now. And so we wanna know what challenges do you face right now, which would be in this environment, and how are you addressing them or what tools, resources, or support do you need from a technology perspective to address them? Um, another one of our deliverables will be taking all of these best practices and issues and, and similar to what we did as a large committee in February, issuing some sort of paper, probably more succinct, a couple pages uh, we're thinking, on here are the issues we found and here are the uh, proposals to, uh, or best practices we've identified in these areas as well. And then we're gonna look for ways to uh, do different um, outreach uh, to the FOIA community to talk about what best practices are working out there and uh, have practitioners who are uh, champions of those causes, similar to what Bobby and Alina said for the other working groups, uh, to, to, and propose to OIP and to OGIS, here are some speakers you may want to consider who are willing to do that. And we actually have one such that we'll talk about later. But the FOIA ser searches are not, uh, searches are here to stay. The technology becomes important looking at areas like artificial intelligence, technology-assisted review, how do we leverage and balance out the technology and the people aspect of uh, this work? And it's exciting to see it's actually underway. Uh, and if it's not underway, there's an appetite for it. So this group is really, really interesting, and it touches on several of the other groups that we're talking about here today. Uh, but we keep the scope and mandate to each group um, focused. And I, I'll just close with, uh, by saying each of the charters we've talked about, the intention is to post them publicly on the OGIS website because uh, this is a transparency group, and we do want feedback, not just from government agencies, but from the public as well, uh, whether it be through the FOIA Advisory Committee or those of you with us on the line here or in any of the presentations we make, because you, you, you share great ideas, uh, and including we got ideas on how to go about searches from the FOIA Advisory Committee uh, and, and real issues from the requester community, and hearing those issues uh, really helps us uh, decide how do we go about providing the best tools and recommendations. So. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike in about one minute. Uh, he's going to do FOIA Express and FOIA Online. Uh, I'm sure he's about to say the same thing, or, but I'm about to. But we do not endorse any specific product as a committee uh, or the government, just to be crystal clear. What we found is that FOIA Express and FOIA Online are two of the more prominently used IT tools for FOIA case processing. And so, uh, and there, was, there are different ways being used at agencies and different tips and best practices and areas for improvement. So in part of our work to empower FOIA professionals and build confidence, especially in these remote or hybrid remote and on-site times, uh, these are two really important groups and Mike's gonna talk about them now. So Mike, over to you. 
Well, thank you. Yes, neither of us are, or nor anyone on the committee are, uh, are spoke models for any particular product. Um, so, uh, for sure. And what this kind of highlights is that the FOIA, this, the technology committee rather, is a people-driven um, uh, group. It's we're looking for solutions that will help people every day in in their work. And one of the er early areas that we kind of coalesced around communities of interest were both FOIA Express and and FOIA Online. And so I'll just kind of highlight a few of the things that we're going that we're doing um, with these two with these two groups in the in the coming month. Now, um, again, you know, as, as Eric as Eric mentioned, we don't endorse any one of them. However, these two are also uh, a number of members of the committee use these use these products. So as a natural kind of uh, natural area to to look at. And as we look to build these communities of interest, the reality hit and the feedback was from the incredible members of our committee, um, Foy Express, uh, Virginia, and, and Gorka, great um, kind of contributions in terms of perspective, along with other members of the committee that also use FOIA, these, these types of tools, is sometimes you kind of feel alone when you're using this tool. And the reality is that there's many other people in the community doing the same thing that you're doing and probably having the same challenges, and if we work together collectively, we can find solutions to them. For, for example, something that worked um, that maybe my team came up with at BHA as a way to move the ball forward using this, using a, a product, you can also use it at, at your agency. So building those communities of interest is really important. And the FOIA Express group is going to be um, starting that process at the end of the month at the FOIA Express Users Conference. So kind of just as a preview, have a, a bit of some words there and kind of an opportunity for people to, uh, to, to come together. And again, it, this wouldn't happen without the um, kind of the people-driven solutions here, the, the, the members of the committee and, and the requests that we have. We see the need, you know, out there for these things. Um, and then moving to the FOIA online, we have some incredible um, members there. They can help teach what it is to onboard the system. So if you're if you're if you're an agency that doesn't have this type of process, right? It doesn't have a, um, a cost product that you're looking to kind of uh, fit into your FOIA program. We can talk about the lessons of onboarding a process like a, a solution like this or any kind of cost product because there's going to be commonalities with whatever cost product that you that you use. And so understanding kind of the um, kind of the four walls of that, I was fortunate enough to be able to do to, to go through that um, at a previous at another agency. And so there's members on the team as well who can that will help provide those lessons learned and those kinds of best practices as we again as we look to build this community of interest because. At the end of the day, we're all doing FOIA, and if you're using a similar product, you're going to probably end up with many similar challenges kind of across the federal family. And I think that's one of the real strengths of the, of the, uh, the technology committee and, indeed, this meeting uh, it, it itself. So uh, those are just kind of um, – I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things that the FOIA Express and the FOIA Online groups are doing. But, again, as we look to, as we look to finalize our charters in the coming week, we'll have that clear mandate in terms of what we want to, um, what we want to accomplish and we're looking forward to, to moving, for, moving forward in those areas of building that kind of community of interest for folks to be able to share best practices, to be able to share lessons learned, and in many ways to make sure people understand that they're not alone out there, you know, doing these things and that this technology is there to assist them. And it's something not to be afraid of, but something to be embraced, that you can really drive positive change in your FOIA program and, and um, you know, drive down backlogs increase request for satisfaction, of course, mitigate litigation, and, and all of these things that flow from having a more efficient FOIA, FOIA program, uh, and we're hoping to, to, uh, to leverage that success uh, moving forward in, in the coming fiscal year. So back to you, Eric, for FOIA and classified information. Great. Thanks, Mike. FOIA and classified information. Uh, this one has been particularly challenging this year because of the pandemic. Uh, and and uh, reviewing classified information, of course, happens uh, in, in uh, certain facilities and not everywhere. Uh, it, it's uh, a challenge. But this group is looking at the challenges the community faces in general with classified information um, and uh, whether it touches on the areas I mentioned before, like search or the tools, but also how do we think holistically across the government on other mandates that are out there, such as those in Executive Order 13526 on um, the mandatory declassification review request, the 25-year review mandates, how does technology play a role in what gets declassified and requested? Uh, how can we leverage technology better uh, and what technology is on the various classified networks, which, of course, we can't go into right now, but looking into these discussions 
Um, here we have um, representatives from three different agencies, um, and we, we are looking to, to, uh, for additional participation on this group um, who work with classified information. Uh, given the pandemic, uh, there's concerns about our ability to, to move forward in certain areas of this work, but we have been able to talk generally about the issues that we're facing without getting into classified information. Uh, for this group, we're currently uh, kind of discussing issues that we face uh, among the, the three participants so, uh, on that pan working group right now, um, and we're going to talk to uh, key agencies and stakeholders that deal with declassification. I know we've heard uh, this interest um, in the public, uh, there's the PITIV group that's out there. There are other groups that are talking about declassification issues. So we're trying to stay plugged into all, overall declassification issues and then channel that and harness and focus that into FOIA as well. Um, so we're currently uh, doing our kind of initial preliminary research of the issues uh, that we, not just we know about, that we, but, but we've also seen are out there. And our next steps would be to hold some sort of uh, meeting of the government officials who work on, with classified information, ideally in a secure way, because uh, we don't want to have any type of issues of uh, so security matters discussing these, these issues. Um, but we're going to go as far as we can remotely. And I will say I'm very proud of this technology committee and the various members Mike mentioned and uh, the ones on the committees uh, that I oversee. Uh, we, they've been working really hard remotely in addition to their regular day jobs with FOIA, taking on these additional responsibilities as well. And it's really appreciated. There's a lot of good work that goes on. It doesn't often get recognized. So I take this opportunity to say thank you also to all of you at the chief FOIA officer level who are, uh, have your members participating with our group. Uh, for artificial intelligence, we have a working group uh, that's doing a great job getting a lay of the land of what is being used out in the government for AI in general. Uh, understanding what's being done for artificial intelligence with regard to records management, and then for FOIA. Uh, as Mike has said, uh, we are a group committed to action. So here's one of the things uh, I'm very excited to talk about. Uh, we have, ten I think, tentatively, if not actually scheduled for November 5th, a session for FOIA practitioners, for government officials, an introduction to AI, and it's with a focus on FOIA. And this will be kind of a FOIA, an AI, FOIA AI 101. And this group uh, is going to, uh, it's uh, chaired by uh, Nick Wittenberg. Uh, he's doing a great job. Uh, we have a wonderful group of uh, participants on this committee. Uh, the AI working group uh, is going to lead this November 5th discussion, kind of what is AI, go through some key terms about what AI is and is not, uh, then look at the FOIA, uh, look at the FOIA community and how AI either is, but more like the, the more of a lean toward how it could help with FOIA searches, FOIA review, FOIA case processing, moving forward. And it, it, while a lot of this is internal to agencies and how we're processing, um, of course, if there are ways we could leverage it to improve the user experience on the other end, uh, that's also very important and something we'll have to build to over time. But right now, we're, we're working just to get people familiar with um, uh, the AI session. It's on November 5th, I believe is the date, November 5th, um, and there will be information about that as well. Um, the uh, November 5th session, like I said, will be for government officials, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is FOIA AI 101, that we may have a 201 or a 301 series in this moving forward. Um, and even in the 101 session, uh, I encourage all of you, whether you're at the chief FOIA officer level or your proxies or, or your, your employees to attend um, just to become familiar with the conversations that's out there. Because a lot of the work we do in technology uh, in this group is just getting people comfortable with talking about the, these issues and topics. And there's definitely an appetite, and people are generally interested, and you hear more and more about AI every day. But to then understand what it is and isn't, um, and that, that's important. And so our focus is to really provide a primer of here's what AI is, Here's how we think it could help FOIA. And then the best part of these sessions is the dialogue that happens after the engagement. Uh, so uh, it's not just at these sessions, like the, the, the AI session we're gonna hold, it's also in the working group meetings. So we are very excited about uh, this work. And I think AI is gonna be one thing that's here uh, and it'll be an enduring topic, working group discussion, whatever, moving forward, it is here to stay. Uh, so with that, I turn it back over to Mike for video redactions. Thanks, Eric. 
And again, I think we're all very excited about the, the AI um, the AI presentation on the fifth. And you know, no one's no one's backing up a truck filled with FTEs um, to, uh, to help us process. And everyone's records, regardless of the agency, the volume of things that we're producing is increasing. You know, every day. I was rereading Ramsey Clark's memo, 1967 memo for for a training that I was doing for my folks at the end of the year. And some of the same challenges that they had in 19, that we had in 1967 are the same ones that we have today. And hopefully AI is going to help us, you know, bridge that gap finally and get to that next step. So I'm very excited about that and, you know, in that series of um, iterative trainings so we can get all get up to speed on this important and critical uh, technology that I think is really going to be the future of our field. Another uh, burgeoning area is something that we produce more and more and, you know, we create these federal records, these things that are used in our operation that requesters have a legitimate uh, reason and rationale to request and we have a reasonable obligation to produce uh, comes with video redaction. You can't walk into a Veterans uh, Health Administration hospital facility without being under a CCTV and I think that's kind of the norm in many areas. The Social Security Administration pro, uh, office, the field office, you walk in there and there's going to be a CCTV and if an incident happens, there's going to be uh, certainly a request for video, given the video age that we live in. And so, again, as Eric talked about, we are a committee of action. And so we thought we would share some of the early findings from the video redaction um, uh, working group. So if we could move to the next slide, I want to share five of the early uh, kind of findings that we found and give you some actionable tools to walk away from from this, from this presentation. Okay. So, again, these are five of the early uh, findings. We're going to look forward to a full presentation that we're going to provide um, with this working group as part of their charter. Um, but we want to just kind of give you a taste of some of the early findings and give you, you know, again, a few things to, to take away. The video retention schedules can vary widely. Some of these, some of the videos that you'll see when you walk into a, into a building uh, may have a 30-day loop, may have a 14-day loop. It, it's going to vary from system to system to system. And a lot of these are age dependent. How old is the system? What's the capacity of the server to hold this information? So if a request isn't received and, prop and promptly processed to put a hold on that information, say October 14th at, at, uh, at 11.20 a.m. something happened at this uh, Social Security Administration office. Well, if you don't put a hold on that very quickly, that tape's gonna get, get uh, overdubbed or that uh, data's gonna be dumped and, and oftentimes it's not recoverable. So a key to process these things early and understanding what your record retention schedules are if you're going to have a, you know, run a successful and transparent FOIA program. Another one is that the tools vary in complexity. So matching the tools to the job we found in, in the FOIA field. So you could get a very robust system that you could basically make, uh, you know, the next iteration of Star Wars on, or you can get something that does a very simple task and the complexity varies, right? Like, you know, what level of education do you need to have or felicity with these tools do you need to be able to properly redact these, um, these moving images? Because some of them are very complex and, and labor and time intensive, intensive. So matching the tool to the job, do you get a program that costs $5,000 and takes, a th takes three weeks to learn how to do it in a rudimentary way, or do you have a tool that's maybe more targeted for what you're looking to do, which is basically blur faces and voices, you know, largely? Um, Another key, another key early finding was that lit, litigation can drive schedules and agency resource allegation. Everyone who's been in FOIA for any significant period of time has probably dealt with uh, a litigation and court-mandated schedules, and you don't want to miss a court-mandated schedule. So if the court says you must have this by date certain, then the agencies are often forced to scramble and allocate resources in a reactionary way. So those schedules, those production schedules can drive how the agency allocates funding. And so the sense is what can we do proactively, you know, as directors of FOIA programs or, you know, as senior folks, as chief FOIA officers, as we're making our resource requests for our fiscal years so we don't have to go into kind of unallocated funds and tap into those budgets that the agency may have other priorities for because, you know, certainly <laughs> The Veterans Health Administration has plenty of uh, use for funding during this COVID pandemic. So going to them and saying, hey, I need uh, 200 grand to, uh, to stand up a, a video redaction team in the midst of that isn't going to be received as well as if I say it, you know, now, um, you know, prior and say, hey, this is an ongoing demand. We need to have this resource capability or these are the consequences and we need to make a management decision to see, you know, what the, what the business use is, uh, is there for, the, for, that, uh, for that resource. 
ear, earmarking funds for FOIA contractors uh, with specialized skills that some agencies have done uh, can be very efficient. So rather than taking um, someone who may or may not be very uh, proficient with this type of advanced software and hiring that skill out, right? So, you know, you could change the brakes on your car, but you don't, most people anyway, right? So you take it to a brake specialist, someone that can, that can change your brakes. And likewise, if you have an occasional, you know, very rare FOIA request that's going to demand video redaction, rather than having, you know, your one or two or three FOIA officers spend three weeks learning this tool and then using it when they could have processed 15, 20, you know, some number of requests that would then preclude further litigation or preclude other issues popping up, backlog increases and the like, it may make more sense just to take that off your plate. You don't necessarily have to do everything in, in, a, FOIA, um, in a FOIA office if you um, are able to allocate some resources, earmarks and funds for kind of a surge capability or capacity rather when you get these types of requests in. However, a really visionary um, member of this, of this working group, and I'm so proud of the, the work that, that's happened in this, uh, in this video redaction group is, to, is the recommendation to consider adding the video redaction skills to your PDs and to performance plans. As we all think about succession planning and bringing new talent into our FOIA programs, it's very likely that um, people in different de generations will have more felicity with these tools. They'll have, they'll have grown up on Instagram. They'll have grown up videoing things and doing projects over and over in school. So building that in could be an entree way for, for a professional, an individual looking to find a FOIA career. That could be the one key differentiator that makes them a great member of your team moving forward. So kind of building that into your PD and adding those video redaction skills to performance plans, if you're an agency that, that has this, could be a really useful thing, um, really useful thing moving forward. It'll help those folks that are lo even looking for jobs, you know, as they do their keyword searches to say, oh, well, I've got this background, and now I can take this background and apply it in a really special way in, in working in transparency for the federal government. So just having that there in the USA Jobs is a key word for people to search uh, could be useful as we're looking to, to strengthen our own benches. I know uh, we've got 300-plus FOIA officers all across the country. Having a handful of guys or gals that know this technology really well is really useful. It really is a force multiplier for our entire uh, entire program. It doesn't have to be at every facility, but having a handful of folks that know what they're doing in that area is, is super useful. So again, we just felt that it would be important to, to give you a little taste. You know, we're very excited about the AI piece first, and then I think next will be the video redaction, and we're going to roll these um, presentations out and this information out as quickly as we can to the FOIA community to give you the best um, the best thoughts of the folks that are doing this. You know, and again, it's an action-oriented group. We want to get this information out as quickly as we can so we can help, you know, be a resource, a real go-to resource for folks in the FOIA community looking to add tech to innovate and streamline and increase, efficient, increase efficiencies in their programs. So with that, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we'll give it a toss over to Eric for um, what our working group's uh, next steps are. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we've already talked about finalizing the charter, so our target is to be done by next month. And so uh, you can check the OGIS website, uh, and we, our targets to have that com those completed and posted. They are living documents, so they're subject to change, but we're really trying to focus on the, the they have target deadlines for each deliverable. So that's where we are with the, the charters. Uh, then, of course, as Mike and I discussed, implementation. Uh, the, hold some of the sessions, including the November 5th uh, workshop. I believe information about that will come out from OIP or OGIS. Uh, so uh, stay, stay tuned or check their websites, uh, and they may touch on those points. Uh, we're going to look at other sessions on potential video redaction and looking at uh, FOIA Express and FOIA Online and exploring ideas. Um, Mike, back over to you. Sure. And Complete is a really important word here, right, because I don't think we'll ever um, be complete with technology. It's always a changing and always an iterative thing. But we really want to knock out these recommendations in, in the FOIA report. Um, I mean, sorry, in our, in our report in terms of we've maintained a technology committee. And, again, you know, we've made a ton of progress on a number of these things. But, you know, working on getting those schedules out, um, you know, assisting where we can. There's other folks working on these things as well to make sure that age, um, operations of all size, can have access to the same tools that Eric might have or I might have or other large uh, agencies might have. You know, 
making sure that we're getting this information out. The, the AI piece is a great first step, and then video redaction, uh, FOIA on my FOIA Express, these things are going to roll out and roll out and roll out. And, it, you know, serving as that body, is the, you know, first putting the information out on our, on our website, or just website, but then also serving as that go-to group where you've got a question, you've got, a, you've got something going on. You're not alone in this field. You know, again, a lot of this is about building community. There's so many of us out here, 5,000 plus in this community, doing the same thing largely, right? You know, it's not just drawing red boxes around things, but we're all doing important things in terms of moving the transparency of our agencies forward. Because so many of us, indeed, near all, indeed all of us, have great stories to tell about our agencies, the great work that's going on in each of our agencies, whether it be state or Veterans Health or, or NIH or wherever it may be. But, you know, being able to serve, um, you know, to help you get that message out on, the, on that tech side is, is so critical. And part of that is what we're doing right here and soliciting, right? We're getting feedback from the chief boy officers today. We're getting feedback um, consistently and excellent feedback from Alina and Bobby and folks on their teams in terms of what directions we should be going on. Because, again, Alina and Bobby have, have so many inputs in terms of people kind of going to them, and they're able to kind of help steer us and help us go in, in, a, great, in a great direction. And that, um, that member-driven focus that we have on, on these working groups, each person self-selecting, and bringing their expertise to bear in a critical area of FOIA, uh, FOIA management and FOIA innovation. So with that, I think we want, to, we want to pivot exactly to that solicitation, and we want to have that active dialogue with, you know, our fellows in the uh, FOIA community. So next slide, please. And we'd love to open it up and have, um, you know, as robust a dialogue as possible in terms of any questions that folks may have, anything that you would like to know about the, um, the technology committee, things that we have coming up in our calendar, um, areas that we're, that, we're, that we're working on. Uh, we're very happy to take questions, and if we can't answer them, we're happy to, um, to, get, back to get back to you uh, on, those, on those topics. Great. So I guess Alina and Bobby, is our, are we going to answer some questions now? Or, or we... Yeah, that would be great. Um, I'm actually going to turn to Lindsay because I think we've had a couple of questions at least come in during chat, uh, through chat. So, Lindsay? Yes, so we have a couple of, we have a couple of questions. Um, we also had one public comment, a couple of public comments come in, which I'll hold till the end. Um, but some of the questions may be directed to uh, Bobby and Alina as well, so I'll just read out what we have so far. Uh, but in the meantime, if anyone would like to add a question in the chat, um, go ahead and do that. Okay, so one question about FOIA reporting. Uh, the question is, because many agencies have not had physical access to their FOIA tracking system, does OIP have plans to allow agencies to submit an amended annual FOIA report after the initial submission in November once agencies are able to access their tracking systems? So, Bobby, I'll leave that for you. Yeah, so um, I encourage uh, you to just reach out to us directly so we can under better understand the limitations. We'll work with each agency to be able to get them uh, the final agency annual FOIA report um, reviewed and uh, <clears throat> Uh, finalized and posted on, on time. Obviously, just knowing a better understanding of what the limitations are will probably help us. Uh, anyone who has any FOIA reporting questions, please just reach out to us. Um, uh, we're at, we're uh, our compliance team, headed by Lindsay, is uh, standing by to assist agencies with both their annual FOIA report data and their chief FOIA officer reports. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about info and registration for the AI conference. Um, I can go ahead and answer that. We're going to be announcing that information very soon. So we don't have registration available yet, but it will be um, within the next week. Thank you. And I believe that is all of the agency questions. Um, we'll just give it one more moment if there are any additional agencies that have questions to enter in the chat. Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to you, Alina. Lindsay, you said you had a question from uh, one of our uh, agencies in the IC. Oh, yes. Um, so we did receive a question from somebody at ODNI, uh, just asking generally about how agencies are 
handling classified information during this uh, pandemic and, and max telework situation. So I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that, but I know Eric and Mike, you spoke briefly about your working group. Um, sure, this is Eric. I know um, it, it, the, the uh, IC is a, uh, made up of several different agencies, so it, it's hard to discuss it as one thing. I think each has their own respective FOIA programs. They have their own challenges they're facing. Uh, I, well, from what I found is that there are office, there are offices in, in different places um, but overall, the, the, the challenges they face with processing classified information in general, uh, technology searching are, are similar to those that I've already covered previously, and I really don't have anything else to add on that other than to say uh, we do look forward to engaging with more uh, uh, employees in the government who work with classified information, including uh, IT agencies, on those challenges uh, pre-COVID, during COVID, and moving forward. I don't know, Mike, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that's I think that's right, and I think this has been a tremendous learning experience for everyone in the FOIA community, um, and not just in the FOIA community, but you know, in terms of having to do this traumatic pivot and being able to access these things remotely. Um, I know we've been in a, um, we were in a, a really quick uh, learning curve to uh, to make this work, and we were able to we had tremendous success this year. We're very fortunate due to the hard work of our folks, you know, all across uh, you know our our agency. But yeah, it's definitely a huge learning curve and an area that we're looking to add um, lessons learned and, and add kind of contributions as, as we move forward in this process. I just want to take a second to give a shout out to uh, some of our attendees who are actually technology committee members. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. If any of you guys Want to add anything to the discussion, anything that Eric and Mike should have said that they didn't, which I'm sure is not the case, um, please feel free to chat. Um, and I've also been kind of remiss, and I apologize for this, any of our um, agency friends who want to chime in orally, if you press pound two on your telephone line, you will be able to come through, and uh, our event producer, Michelle, can, um, can let you in. So. Uh, if you prefer not to type anything out and you just want to talk at us, um, that's certainly an option as well. So, uh, just, Martha, I, if I can no. go, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, that's Alina's, and uh, we tried to try. I tried. We tried to trust this, I think, but it's really worth repeating. The real strength of the committee is 45 plus members the energy and the direction that they bring. Eric and I just happen to be the guys that are, that are lucky enough to be able to work with them. I mean, really, the energy coming from the, from the folks in the working groups is what's going to move the ball forward and what is really transformative in this, um, I think, and what makes the group so, um, you know, kind of indeed powerful in, in terms of the energy that's bringing and the real solutions that, that the folks on these committees want to, want to bring to bear to the larger FOIA community. So, yeah, a huge thanks to each and every one of the folks um, on the committee and people that are considering joining the other committees, you know, kind of your commitment to move the ball forward in, in this field for all of us is fantastic. I mean, it really is transformative. And we're, you know, we, we are FOIA, right? We're the people that decide what happens in this field. And if we get together and move the ball forward together, then it's going to be a great field. If we don't, you know, it, it's going to be what's going to be. But the people that dedicate their additional time and energy to making it better for everyone in the FOIA community is just fantastic. And I have huge gratitude to each and every one of them for, for, uh, for that. I don't know if there are other comments, but Alina and Bobby, uh, all the panel, all the participants today and everyone, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I know we, we talked a lot about technology, but technology is, is, is we need it now to be successful. Uh, and, and it is, I think, worthy of the, the time we've merited and appreciate all the time we've taken this opportunity. Uh, so um, uh, if there's nothing else, at least want to say thank you. Um, and. Uh, Really appreciate this opportunity today. Thank, thank you, Eric and, and Mike. I, we all really appreciate it, and I think the uh, and everyone on the committee. This is really a, a really great illustration of the success of the council and 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 the your committee's work has been incredible. And couldn't agree more that technology is, was always important for it, but even more so now. And um, Mike and Eric, you promised to stick around in case people think of mm -hmm. other questions uh, before we end today. So thank you for that in advance. Um, Martha tells me there are no um, questions from agency folks on the YouTube channel so far, but maybe 
folks are still thinking about things. Uh, but I think, Bobby, if you're ready, we can now turn to the public comments portion of our program today. I know we're running a little bit early, but uh, maybe we give everyone uh, half an hour back today at least. Uh, but we have now reached the public comments part of our council meeting. So with that, uh, we look forward to hearing from folks in the public who have ideas or comments to share. Uh, we will also be opening up our telephone line. So, Michelle, can you please provide the telephone instructions again for everyone? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question or comment via phone, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad to enter the question or comment queue. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name and question. Once again, pressing pound 2 will enter you into the queue. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Lindsay, I know we have a couple of, at least a couple of public chat comments that uh, we were saving till the end. And yes. uh, I'm going to turn it over to you first. Great. Thank you. Uh, so the first public comment uh, from Mr. Harrington, the comment is, it's, it's a bit long, uh, but I will read it. <laughs> I will read it all. Thank OGIS you. states that the Chief FOIA Officers Council is charged with, quote, developing recommendations for increasing FOIA compliance and efficiency. Yet when it comes to compliance with FOIA, it is difficult to understand how many people are processing requests at each agency. As Director Bobby Talibian of OIP claims, agencies are receiving more requests, but are agencies also not hiring more necessary staff to ensure compliance with rising requests? For example, recently, FDA provided me information that due to an increase in the number of incoming requests, we may be unable to comply with the 20-day working time limit in this case, uh, as well as the 10 additional days provided by the FOIA. But the FDA makes no mention that there are sometimes one person or two people processing requests at a specific agency, uh, such as FDA ORA FOIA or FDA CVM FOIA. So FDA is not being fully truthful with this information they're putting out, further trying to blame the requester community. For compliance purposes, how can I understand how many government information specialists are processing FOIA requests at each agency? Um, and then this, uh, there's another comment that was submitted via YouTube that is related to this same one, so I'm going to read that as well. It continues, is there a number of employees an agency should have in comparison to the number of FOIA requests received. For example, if FDA ORA is receiving hundreds of requests a month, yet only have two employees, is that considered proper in regards to compliance with FOIA? I just don't understand the talk of these meetings and compliance with FOIA when it seems like there's always understaffing issues, but excuses from agencies are that there are, quote, too many requests. In regards to employees, processing the requests and the number of requests received per month. If there is no such thing, how can we all move towards getting this ratio as a top, top part of the FOIA compliance process? Um, and then there's another question for the tech committee, but I will um, pause on that and give uh, maybe Bobby a chance to respond to this one. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so yes, I mean, agencies have been working on tight type resources um, and not just in the FOIA program. So resources is always is always uh, something that um, we have to be able to address to be able to meet the FOIA demand. And I think the, a lot of the work that we're doing in this council is aimed at that, to best use the resources that we have to get the most efficient uh, and effective um, output of information through both FOIA and proactive disclosures. Uh, there is detailed um, statistics in agency annual FOIA reports on the number of personnel that they uh, that they use in their FOIA that that um, have worked on their FOIA administration, both in terms of full-time FOIA professionals and the equivalent of full-time professionals um, that support the agency's FOIA program. Um, and you can get all of that information on FOIA.gov under the data section or on um, uh, our. Uh, our website or the agency's website where they post their annual FOIA report. As far as a ratio, uh, I would say it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one for every agency. It'll depend on the complexity of the records they have, the volume of the records sometimes, um, and uh, maybe the complexities of uh, uh, the types of records that they have, and that can vary by agency. So uh, it, it, you really need to look at that, each agency really needs to look at that 
um, individually to see what amount of resources they need to be able to succeed in their FOIA administration. Uh, and, and we have uh, a lot of tools that help us do that, and the FOIA assessment toolkit helps uh, as far as um, making sure agencies have effective systems as they're reviewing where their resources are, how they're being used. Um, so I would say that the data is out there, um, and we hope people will, will uh, take advantage of it and, and, and look at um, uh, all, all elements of the floor, of agency's FOIA administration. Um, but as far as uh, uh, an equation, I would say that, you know, that the proper amount of resources needed by agency will necessarily vary by the nature of their FOIA uh, program and, and records. Thank you. All right, I'll read uh, the next question from this same member of the public. It is, it seems to be directed to the technology committee, although it, it's possible that others may have input as well. The question is, would the technology committee ever consider building something for the requester community, uh, the public slash citizens, that is similar to Muckrock, where we, members of the public, can always access already released FOIA documents? So this is Eric. I think uh, we definitely would want to hear more about what was uh, envisioned. Uh, I know that there's been work by DOJ to see the intake process and how requests are made. And, and I, I don't want to uh, make a commitment we're not ready to make right now with regard to the FOIA library, because there are a lot of groups looking at this already. I, I, our committee is not focused exclusively on the FOIA libraries or online reading rooms. Uh, but it's definitely something we'd be happy to discuss with OIP and OGIS if they think that they, we should take this on or if it's appropriate for a different fora and a group to discuss. Yeah, I just thanks for that, Eric. I just want to add that uh, the FOIA Advisory Committee's last term, the third term, uh, actually looked at this issue. We had um, some a great interest from a, a particular member of the committee to build this one-stop shopping uh, kind of portal where um, all documents that have been publicly released by agencies could be posted. And unfortunately, the technology is just not there yet. Um, I think FOIA.gov is, is definitely trying very hard to, to meet a lot of those needs by asking agencies to make their, uh, their FOIA portals interoperable with FOIA.gov. Bobby Wright, am I speaking that, about that correctly? Well, as, as far as uh, the, the interoperability would be for the request submission, as far as uh, the getting access to the records already uh, or that being posted, um, that's certainly something that we're working on um, with regard to the the uh, accessib additional accessibility to the FOIA libraries. Obviously, one of the challenges of getting more information out there um, is the issue of 508, which is working, which is a which is a really important working group on this committee. So I think as we as we um, hit this at all angles, we're eventually getting to that point where agencies can proactively post more of the FOIA release record because we have more efficient ways of remediating these records and getting them posted online. And on the other hand, um, FOIA.gov is allowing us to be able to search for and access these uh, FOIA release records uh, more uh, efficiently and more, having them be more accessible. So I think there's actually a number of initiatives now that we have that complement each other that will get us to that point. Great, thanks. All right, thank you. All right, I will move on to the next question from Nate Jones at the Washington Post. The question is for Eric Stein. Secret Secretary of State Pompeo has stated that he will soon release more of former Secretary Clinton's emails. As head of state FOIA and state D-class, did you play any role in this upcoming release? Was it conducted through the typical FOIA or D-class process? Well, thank you for the question. I'm here today in my role as co-chair of uh, this technology committee, and uh, we'd be happy to just uh, provide this response. Any questions uh, about that matter should be, should be referred to State Public Affairs, and the phone number is 202-647-2492. Again, 202-647-2492, or you can send them an email at pa.pressduty at state.gov. All of this information is publicly available on the state.gov website. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we had just a couple of follow-up uh, comments from Mr. Harrington uh, saying that the technology is there. Um, and then also, we want all records released to the public or as many as possible, always publicly available 
uh, thanks for your time. And that concludes the questions from the WebEx uh, at this time. Great. Lindsay, thanks so much. Um, before I turn over to Martha, I think we have a couple of chat questions from the YouTube side. I want to ask our event producer, Michelle, is there anyone waiting on the telephone line to ask any questions? There are currently no questions on the line. A reminder, ladies and gentlemen, pound two will enter you into the verbal question queue. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, Martha, over to you uh, for any questions. Um, sure. So we've got one from um, Mr. James Walker. He says, would you talk, and this is, I think, for um, Eric and Michael, would you talk about how we in industry can engage? So many RPA solutions are available to help take pressure off your fully achieved. Mike, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, right. So RPA, robotic, robotic process automation, you know, being able to um, – take those things that are repetitive and take them off of the uh, FOIA processors' um, plates are is critical, right? You know, anything that, that um, takes FOIA officer away from doing a line-by-line -line analysis of a complex FOIA, of, of a complex FOIA request implicating um, significant agency records to, to be released as part of the transparency mission, you know, is critical, right? So one of the things that we're looking at, uh, at doing, and we talked about this in, as we talked about in the five recommendations, is and venues and opportunities for folks in the, um, in the in, on the industry side to work with FOIA professionals. And really the envision, uh, the vision there, what we envision is an active and robust dialogue because, for example, industry could go and create things in a silo that may not work for folks on the ground doing FOIAs, you know, um, 40 hours a week, 50, 50 weeks a year, but if we have an active dialogue and we work with industry and we tell them exactly what our needs are, you know, real honest dialogue between FOIA practitioners, you know, that are deep in the weeds in this, in this field or deep in this field and industry, it's incredible the synergy that can be found there and, and the solutions that can happen. Indeed, um, some of the things that we've had, some of the dialogue that we've had with our own COPS producer for our systems have, has resulted in some innovations that are coming up. In the, uh, in the next fiscal year in, in future iterations of that software. So, yeah, exactly. Having that venue is critical and having that opportunity to, um, to work with them is critical. And we're, we're partnering um, with Lena and Bobby um, and others to make sure that um, all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted on something um, of that scope and scale. But, yes, that's definitely something to look for in a coming attraction. Uh, Eric, anything you just want to add or Lena or Bobby to that as well? Just two quick points. I think we've been working with agencies, too, to talk about their, their program needs and then to speak IT speak, IT requirements uh, to make sure that, so to, to Mike's point, that's an, being able to list out those requirements uh, clearly matter and to make sure whatever's being laid out matches with the networks, the IT systems, because there are a lot of solutions out there that can do a lot of things, but they have to be compatible, and that's always a challenge. The other one is uh, GSA has a lot of really great things already on its website, um, and then we've worked with uh, OGIS and OIP just to kind of see what's out there already for different tools and solutions. So there are ways that we're looking to engage uh, with uh, the private sector and the, pub and the public on these points more. So, uh, yeah, as Mike said, stay tuned. Okay, I had one more question, and uh, it's a little unclear. Uh, we asked for some clarification. We haven't received any back yet. But um, basically, what um, this is meant for OIP, what area is the most requested for FOIA actions, and what is a ballpark percentage of these overall requests? So I'm not sure what they meant by what area. But. So I'm not sure either, but I, I would just uh, re um, uh, emphasize the, the availability of a lot of this data in the annual FOIA report. Um, as well as um, some helpful information in the Chief Officer Report, but in the annual FOIA report, you can see uh, the number of requests each agency and each component of each agency is getting, and then detailed information about those requests. So not sure exactly um, what the caller is looking for as far as information. Obviously, um, each agency is responding to um, different variety of requests based off the records they have and their program missions. Um, but uh, I think maybe the annual report data would be helpful for the individual asking that question. Okay, thank you. And that's all the questions we had from YouTube. Great, thanks so much, Martha. Um, I did have one other uh, comment that I just wanted to mention from the ODNI 
a friend who is asking that we remind everyone, um, and especially members of the public who are watching today, that it has not been easy for IC agencies during COVID um, to be processing documents due to, of course, the classified nature of their business, um, and that timeframes for responses have been impacted greatly. Uh, I know everyone is working as hard as they can uh, under these constraints. I think um, the IC is asking for a little bit of patience and understanding from the public uh, during these times. What, with that uh, message, I, think I, could, I would just echo you. Uh, part of our guidance and just encourage agencies um, to, to um, in any ways you can, convey the difficulties to the requesters so they have a better understanding uh, of challenges that your agency might be facing because of the necessary workplace precautions and what you can and can't do. Um, agencies have been doing that on their website, but also in um, acknowledgement letters and communications. And so uh, encourage agencies to continue to do that. The, uh, this is one of as transparent as possible and also work with requesters the best we can. Yes, communication is very, very important. That's one of the things that OGIS always stresses, so I want to second that. Lindsay, any other um, questions that might be lurking out there? No additional questions. No. Alina, okay. I saw that quite the the item that might be a question, but it's not clear that that person is an attendee. So um, if anyone okay. does have any questions about annual core report, please contact us. Thank you. Great. That sounds great. All right, Bobby, any parting thoughts? I think we're well, at the end of our session. Yeah. No, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Lena, thank Eric and Mike, um, and uh, thank all of uh, all who are joining us. It's a, a really great meeting, and we look forward to uh, the next meeting, uh, having another good agenda and work of the technology committee and the new work of our new committee. Yep, I, I definitely want to echo what Bobby said. Thanks to everyone today for attending our council meeting. Um, thanks in advance to those of you who have already volunteered to work on the new committee or are thinking about it, so don't be shy. And uh, I hope everyone who's joining us today continues to remain safe, healthy, and resilient, both you and your families. Uh, we will reconvene in 2021 uh, with future dates of council meetings to be announced uh, soon. So please stay tuned for that. And um, if there are no other comments or questions, we can adjourn this council meeting today. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank stay you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.